All right, we are live. Welcome back everyone to We Belong Here, our series at Advanced Native Political Leadership, where we talk with leaders throughout Indian country on the topics and the work building political power. That includes educating our public on positions that impact our lives. And I wanna extend a warm welcome to all of our new relatives, our guests um, uh, that have come in to watch our, our, our series. So thank you and welcome to, to watching our series. Tonight's Facebook Live conversation is around sisterhood, which is featuring a trio of native state legislators. And the state legislatures are an arena where uh, our indigenous women are starting to show up all over the country. It's, a, it's an arena where uh, we are running and winning and taking a place of power amongst the house that govern our communities within our state. Uh, so we are gonna be joined by North Dakota State Representative Ruth Buffalo from the MHA Nation, Kansas State Representative Dr. Ponka Wee Victors, Ponka and to, forgive me, um, Tano Atom, I hope I said that correctly, and Representative Christina Haswood uh, from the Diné Nation. These women are connected not only in the sisterhood of kinship, but also leadership. And so I hope we hear more about their story of mentoring each other and how they all are pushing forward on issues that affect not just Native peoples, but all peoples. So let me get some little introductions in here. Uh, first off is we have Representative Dr. Punko Wee Victors uh, serving the Kansas State uh, House of Representatives and she represents District 103. She came into office in January 2011 and currently serves until 2023. Uh, Representative Christina Haswood uh, is uh, also a member of the Kansas State House of Representatives. She serves District 10, I believe, and which is the Southeastern Douglas County, including Baldwin and parts of Lawrence, Kansas. Uh, she's one of the youngest members of the Kansas State Legislature, as well as the third Native, member, Ma Native American member in the body's history. And then we have Representative Ruth Anna Buffalo, who is in the North Dakota State House of Representatives from District 27. She won her election and started serving in December of 2018. Is that right? I feel like that was, that was wrong. <laughs> um. And now okay, sir, <laughs> uh, is the only Native Democratic woman elected to the North Dakota State Legislature. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, I love your story and uh, of encouraging one another to run for office. Can some of you talk to how you know each other and how you, you are now serving in elected office? I'll let Ruth go first. <laughs> Yeah, so um, good evening, or um, it's Madzagadads. Thank you for the invite. It's really good to be in this virtual space with all of you, um, amazing women. Um, and thank you for tuning in. So yes, I, I was um, a legislative intern in 2014 for Representative Pankawi Victors. Um, I had actually reached out to her and asked if she had any openings or how I wanted to learn how I could become more involved, um, but I was interested in interning and not interested in getting paid, but just wanting to volunteer and find ways to engage and learn more about the legislative process. And um, from there, she said, send me a resume. And then I was able to become her um, 2018, or excuse me, <laughs> I don't know why 2018 keeps coming up. <laughs> I slipped, um, 2014 legislative intern. And it was a really good experience. Um, it just, it gave me the extra nudge um, to take the plunge to run for office. So um, prior to that, I had attended a the boot camp where you were a faculty in residence at Punk, uh, Prairie Rose in Fargo, um, the new women's or back then, or it was formerly known as the New Women's Leadership Institute. Um, and it's a boot camp. And um, actually, Representative Punk Wee Victors was also a faculty in residence as well, I think in 2016. <laughs> and then I was later a faculty in residence in. Uh, I think 2017. Um, so it was a really good, strong support network um, in the area for the Dakotas, I believe. It's um, it's uh, affiliated with Rutgers. So anyways, I think I'm rambling, but so that's a little bit of, of how I um, became um, to, I be, you know, 
got into the political arena, but it was from really um, interning for Pankawi Victors. Thank you. Can I also add that she's a former Miss Indian Nations as well. Oh. And so I used to work at United Tribes Technical College and, you know, we had the international powwow there. And um, so that was, I was just very starstruck and like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And then she's a legislator, you know, <laughs> so, yeah. That's super cool. I love seeing that like transition from one leadership position to another. I didn't know that about you. Very cool to know. Yeah, I'm still in that fishbowl. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and my name is Representative Dr. Pankawi Victors and um, Representative Buffalo, uh, yeah, she interned for me uh, kind of at the beginning of my legislative career. So it was really awesome to have that kind of support and sisterhood started because back then um, I was the only native in the whole, the whole capital, <laughs> the whole legislature. So it was nice to have that sisterhood and like, you know, just to relax and be myself in my office and, and talk to her. Um, it's, it was just, it, it's a really good feeling because, you know, in politics, you can't trust a lot of people, but I knew I could count on her and I could trust her. And that trust just bonded. Um, and we've continued to stay in contact throughout all these years and what Ruth, uh, or I'm sorry, Representative Buffalo, um, whatever her dreams are, or, you know, I'm always there to support her no matter what and try to do the best I can on this end in Kansas to help her. Um, and, um, you know, our bond has just gotten stronger, especially being in this political arena because nobody knows what we go through. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter which state, um, we all go through similar things and she will text me and I will text her. We'll check on each other. Um, so that's great. And um, I really appreciate that. And that's what's really gotten me through over the years. And I met Representative Haswood um, last year. She came to a um, the Murdered and Missing Indigenous Women. I had a press conference at the Capitol and she came there um, in her regalia and was full support and wanted to help. And um, one of the things about me is I always keep my ear to the ground, trying to figure out how we can get more native women elected. And um, an opportunity came up, a, a Lawrence um, rep, uh, we shared an office together and she said, I'm not gonna run again. Do you have anybody in line? And I didn't at the time, but I said, yeah, I do. But that night I went through and I looked through, who can I ask like real quick, you know, and, and who would be with, like, see, I, I didn't have an opportunity to sit and think like for a year about it. I just kind of got in there. Um, it, like it, like, I think I was given like a, a day to decide if I was going to run. Um, a legislator had approached me. And so the same thing, um, I, I knew who she was, but I didn't have any of her contact information. And I'm not sure if we were even friends on Facebook, but I knew another girl in the Lawrence area, if she could contact her. And then from that, uh, me and um, Representative Haswood, our relationship uh, grew as well. And um, talk about trust. She just trusted me, <laughs> uh, whatever, you know, to just kind of put her in this political arena, you know, we have so many obstacles that we have to go through anyway, but she really trusted me and um, I appreciate that and, and my advice. And um, now that we work together, it is a big like kind of relief because I don't have a lot of, um, you know, uh, pressure on my shoulders cause she's there to help. And like uh, we just passed um, the murdered and missing indigenous bill in Kansas. And um, this is her first bill and she's not even been in a full session, but she did a heavy load on this, on this bill. And um, she listened, you know, I always say, I hate being a drill sergeant. I feel like to, to represent a Buffalo and Aswood, but you know, I want, I want them to learn it the right way. And I want them to, 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 you know, learn the process and the political process, the arena and, and man, have they, They've learned firsthand and, 
And um, not many freshmen can say that. I, I, I know uh, Representative Buffalo can. She passed numerous bills her first term. So I'm proud. I'm just, I'm proud of these two um, beautiful women. So that's, um, that's my little story. <laughs> And I guess on my end, um, <laughs> you know, thank you so much for having us here today. And these women are amazing, incredible, and I look up to each and every one of you um, and a lot more of, uh, you know, role models out there who are probably watching right now. Um, you know, Representative Dr. Victor's uh, probably said it all, but I guess on my end, um, after that day when I saw the Missing or Indigenous uh, press release last year, I was coming off of an internship at in Washington, D.C. at Native American Political Leadership Program. And I was just so curious on how you know, Native representation was at the state level. And I was working on missing and indigenous peoples in the urban area. And I asked um, Representative Dr. Victors at her press release, like, how can we you know, get this into the urban communities? Because I represent, I'm born and raised in Lawrence, uh, raised in District 10 my entire life. It includes Haskell Nations University. We need to make sure that this expands um, to all of the entirety of indigenous peoples of Kansas. Um, after that, I you know, started to get more involved in pol politics. And um, when that opportunity arise about a year ago, almost almost a little a year ago, um, I got a phone call. I was, I was still in grad school. I got a phone call from um, her contact and it was a Thursday evening at 9 p.m. I remember exactly because I thought she was going to call me and how we can get the Native American caucus going back in Kansas. And I was so excited because I met her at a conference like a month ago. And sure enough, she was like, hey, you want to run for office? I was like, are you are you serious? <laughs> it was just a surreal moment. Like I got done finishing a paper and submitting it. And I was just like, what? And, you know, it was. Um, it was a, kind of an exciting moment because I always thought I wanted to run for office. I didn't think it would be, you know, fresh out the gate. But, um, you know, then I uh, was like, talk to Representative Dr. Vickers and she'll explain it all. <laughs> so I called her. I was like, hi. I was like, I don't know if you remember me. <laughs> we met a year ago. <laughs> and then everything just took off from there. And I also um, gave Representative Buffalo a call, too. And I was like, you're a public health gal as well and you know what am i getting myself into and you know things are you we share a lot of the same obstacles um but i always you know text them or call them if i have even such the slightest question and no question is a dumb question um and you know with our passage of our hb 208 missing Marine indigenous peoples bill um it was a really fulfilling moment because that's how i met representative dr victor's but I also got to bring Indigenous people from my community, my district, and I taught them how to testify. Um, and so it was this like same cycle because Re Representative Dr. Victor has taught me how to testify several months ago, and now I'm doing it with other young Indigenous peoples in my community, and it's just been such an amazing um, experience so far. Yeah, I know when uh, Representative Buffalo passed a similar bill in North Dakota, the state legislature had hadn't even considered a, a, a database for missing people in general. So, um, you know, finding these gaps in our state uh, mechanisms and administration and adding to the procedures is just holding them accountable and uh, incredible, incredible movement going forward. I think about um, your, your relationship with one another and, and the similarities of the experiences that you're having um, and, and prior to running, and, and Dr. Dr. Victors, I think this is kind of for you too, uh, being the first of the three to run and, and win ele elected office, what were those moments or experiences that kind of pushed you to run? I mean, you might have been asked, but there was probably an inkling already saying, this needs to change. <laughs> so what, what are some of those moments or experiences that you can speak to? Um, I was an intern um, for the uh, Morris K. Udall Native American Congressional Intern to Internship in Washington, D.C. And um, I was attending all those hearings for the Senate of Indian Affairs Committee. So I had just graduated with my bachelor's in biology. So I was interested more in the science part. But after I got to um, our nation's capital, I remember asking then chairman, because um, we had access to um, Chairman uh, um, John McCain's um, office and uh, rep uh, Senator Dorgan, I believe, back then too. Um, and they were like our, our um, 
like our mentors when we were there. And I remember asking them, how come there's no natives that are on the Senate of Indian Affairs Committee? And they said, I said, why is everybody making decisions for us? And he said, that's a good question. He said, you should run for office someday. <laughs> and I had it in my head that I would run for office when I was like, you know, older, like 70. <laughs> and they're like, no, you can run right now. This is what you do. You know, you go home, you get involved in local campaigns and you learn the process, you, you network, you meet people. So that's exactly what I did. And I think I was 24 at the time. And when I finished my master's degree, I, I decided then I wanted to go into policy. So I got my master's in public administration. And um, by 28, I was running for office. So um, I, I give my credit to them because they opened up that, wow, I, I, you mean I could do it? You know, I'm not, I'm not rich, you know? <laughs> I never been rich. I went to, you know, uh, public school my whole life and, and, and I grew up in the city. And, and they were like, no, you could, you could run, you know, whenever you want to. And so I thought about it and, and, um, I'm a spiritual person and, um, you know, when the opportunity came, I prayed about it and, um, I thought, well, this is it. <laughs> so I decided to run, um, for office, but it was, it, and, and before that I was always, um, interested, like uh, I was in the time when they had the Columbine shootings um, in Colorado, and I didn't I remember I didn't feel safe going to school. So I remember I wrote my governor. Then I must have been like in high school. Um, so I always question things. And another thing with IHS, like why, you know, our healthcare was like it was. Prisoners get better healthcare than we do sometimes. And so I always question things like that. And then when this internship came up, I thought, well. I'm going to science, but you know, I'm just gonna go check it out. See, I never been to DC before, and man, it just opened up a whole, you know, new ideals and goals. Representative Buffalo or Haswood want to answer that question too? Moments or experiences that kind of pushed you to run? Um, sure, I can um, share real quick. Um, um, I was in grad school at NDSU and uh, we were organizing um, as moms. Um, not that wasn't what we were advertising, like, you know, moms against hate or anything like that. But one of my colleagues in grad school just happened to be a mom and our children were in the school system um, in the Fargo-Moorhead area. And there was a... Um, a person coming to town with a very um, unkind platform targeting Native Americans. And so we had met with the venue and asked if they could postpone or cancel it, but they declined. And so we thought, well, we'll just do a peaceful demonstration on the other side of the road from the venue. And it kind of picked up a lot of steam and media attention and the person ended up um, canceling the show. And so from that point, forward, you know, we, as with anything, when you're trying to create change, um, you kind of get like, you know, um, hate mail or, you know, mean messages and things like that. And so, um, but I remember thinking, you know, what's it going to take for things to change? You know, we're, we're trying to prevent our children from experiencing the same things we did as kids, and it's still happening. And so um, I love North Dakota, you know, this is where where I'm from, born and raised, and this is where I'll die, you know, and so it's just, you know, as a mom, it just made me want to find ways to figure out how can we change um, things across the state as a whole, and so the timing, I guess you can say, was really, um, people kept asking me, you know, if I would run for office, and, um, and so we were kind of already fired up. And so I was like, yeah, I'll run for office. I'll do it, you know, <laughs> even though I didn't feel 100% ready. And I know as women, we never do, or, you know, anybody who maybe not doesn't come from a political family or a wealthy family. Um, and so I took the plunge and ran in 2016. I uh, was just finishing up grad school. I remember my advisor was, you know, frowning upon it definitely. And, um, but I ran in a statewide race for insurance commissioner and, um, didn't win, but really learned a lot and still remained really 
inspired and motivated by all of the first time voters I met and the people who were thankful to have been listened to or felt heard, you know, so that just really kept me, kept me involved in wanting to continue the work, so. Thank you. And um, touch on my side, um, my background's in public health and I graduated grad school last year and then decided to run for office. Um, but in public health, I know Representative Buffalo knows that a lot of solutions are grant based programs and they're um, there for several years and then they're gone. And I was frustrated with that process and in our public health model policy is the one of the solutions that that can bring systemic change. And once I figure that out and try to bridge things because in public health, they don't. There's no public health and politics. There's like one class I took in grad school and they don't say you should run for office. They say, you know, you can do the policy help policy. Um, so once I was trying to figure that out, I'm going to DC and doing these internships, um, doing internships in the state department and stuff and trying to figure out where was the indigenous voices and where were they given opportunities. And then quickly figuring out that my representatives who, you know, especially in Congress, my Congress person, represents all four tribes of Kansas, including me and my district, and they don't visit the tribes. Um, that infuriated me, frustrated me as a young person and seeing the other young colleagues, um, interns, uh, get frustrated with this process as well. Um, you know, sometimes I got discouraged of not, you know, how much of a fight we have to bring our voices to. Um, but I think my personality and uh, my ambition and optimism um, you know, is still helping me in this tough, tough environment. Um, but once I figured out policy, that's kind of where I started to go towards. Um, and that's how, kind of how I got involved into this policy area and, um, you know, bringing these solutions, but also um, bringing Indigenous voices, because I represent a, a urban Native community as well. And how do we bridge that with the federal regulations, but also respecting municipalities? Um, and trying to figure all that out um, has been great. And also bringing other people along with me. I know Representative Dr. Victors has always been, you know, saying, you know, bring, bring people along with you and to teach other people um, to, uh, with this process. I absolutely love that the three of you are, um, you know, not just getting into the door, but you're holding the door open for others and you're mentoring people into that practice that, really ensures that there's gonna be more leaders like us who are impacted by the issues and the systems, right? The systems that are serving our communities. And we should be those leaders that are in the decision-making room uh, uh, that affect our lives. And you three are, are not just a part of that, but you're modeling that for others. I know, um, you know, firsthand being here in North Dakota that Representative Buffalo is, is holding that door open for others and um, really creating that, that system of support that more of us will run, right? And I know you're doing that in, in Kansas as well. And I'm seeing that kind of happening nationwide, especially in movement spaces, um, that, that identity of what a politician is, right? When Dr. Uh, Victor's is asking two white men, why aren't there people like me in these spaces, right? And they're encouraging you to run for office. We're kind of redefining what a politician is. Um, you know, you don't have to run when you're 70. You're, you can run when you're 18 <laughs> in some states. <laughs> you can run for president when you're 40, right? I mean, there's, there's just these demystifying pieces that you're bringing into these these spaces and saying I don't want to be the only one and I don't want to make a career out of this but these are issues and systems that are affecting me in my life and this is what we can do to change um and with that then so what kind of training did you did you get or did you prepare as you ran for office you know you're saying you only had a year you only had a day um maybe a weekend before you filed <laughs> filed to run for office but what did you do to kind of set yourself up for for that then once you decided to run um for me when i ran back in 2010 there wasn't a lot of programs for women of color wanting to run for office um but the former representative before me, uh, Representative Delia Garcia, she um, is the one that um, 
we kind of did a strategic move where she uh, had another job opportunity in DC and she said, hey, I'm gonna take my name out of the hat. You know, are you willing to, to run for office? Cause she knew I was, I grew up um, in our district and we were like friends when we were, we were younger as well. And I helped her on all our campaigns. And so I'm um, just that experience of watching her. Um, she was a good role model for me. Um, I always kept a close eye on politics. You know, I, I love my government class. So these women growing up and not just Democrats, but like Condoleezza Rice, I mean, I've always watched them um, in the public eye and you're not going to believe it, <laughs> but being tribal royalty <laughs> was, helped because you're always asked to speak um, in front of others. So that was like public speaking. Um, I was not afraid to get up and and talk for others or, you know, be a voice for others um, and have a platform. <laughs> you have a platform when you're running for office too and when you're tribal royalty. So just these titles, um, my dad, I was my dad, um, um, tribal uh, queen in Arizona, Miss Sonoffin Nation. And it's kind of like Miss Navajo Nation. It's really, uh, it's a tough pageant. You have to know your traditional ways and you have to know how to live in the modern society. So those kind of experiences really helped um, shape me as far as um, being a leader and anything that I, you know, anybody that came to me and said, hey, we're having like this boot camp try a uh, training, I signed up for it. <laughs> I went, you know, and a lot of different groups reached out to me because they knew I was in a unique situation because I was a woman of color. I was, I was, um, like I said, I was 28. I didn't really, you don't really know what you're getting into until you're into it. Like I said, I watched uh, Representative uh, Garcia that whole time, but I really didn't know um, when I was in it. And then it was like, oh no, you know, um, I had, but I had a lot of women mentors that I counted on and I, and I could ask them anything um, personal or political. So it was building those relationships that I could go to um, during that time, which really helped me um, you know, be a, be a, um, to become a strong advocate. Uh, I am thinking back to, uh, local resources here in North Dakota. Um, so of course the, the internship with representative Pankawi Victors was great hands-on training. Um, it was amazing to see a young native woman um, really holding her her own in a, in a legislative space. Um, I remember so many different um, stories of, of how I was just um, blown away with her leadership and her fearlessness um, and really getting the job done. And so it was, um, I feel like that was a, the greatest hands-on experience for me. Um, and then other, you know, local, uh, free resources on um, the internship too is free, you know, so it, you know, just taking advantage of what's there locally. We have uh, North Dakota Women's Network here in North Dakota and they offer uh, ready to run, women's ready to run trainings. Um, and I've attended a few of those before I, I ran for office in 2016. Also um, the new women's leadership, I believe it's called Northern Lights, uh, Le Women's Leadership Institute. Um, that's a five-day residential program um, based out of Moorhead, Minnesota, or MSUM Moorhead. Um, so those are some really good experiences. And then just being involved with the community and being, you know, following your passion um, and finding ways. I think naturally all of us are advocates and wanting to stand up for others and um, different life experiences also kind of pushed me into wanting to help fix things that needed to be addressed. So that's kind of what comes to mind for me. And my training, um, after I called uh, these native ladies here, I called a couple more. Um, there's a couple more indigenous peoples that hold office positions in my community. And I just asked them, how'd you do it? Um, and you know, I think uh, the support grew a lot for me, which I feel really lucky and blessed to, um, you know, even to uh, S Senator uh, Red Don Foster and 
you know, um, you know, everyone was willing to help me and explain to me the process. And, um, you know, one of the personal questions I would ask is, you know, what's it really like to be a Native woman running in, you know, a district that, like, for me, it's 80 percent, you know, non uh, white. And, you know, there's a little bit of of a color population, but, you know, I represent I'm going to be representing a a, a population that is not of color. And how do I do that? Um, how do I, you know, I come from this, I'm a proud Diné young woman, but you know, how do we do this in the political, um, that's more appropriate. Um, you know, other training sessions, I feel like I was extremely lucky too to have a campaign team um, that helped ran my campaign and my campaign manager, they, um, everything moved really fast for me, I felt like. <laughs> um, and, they really helped me out um, and, you know, my campaign manager ran a couple campaigns before, so they were pretty seasoned. Um, and uh, I had a lot of volunteers, too, in my community that were high schoolers um, because I didn't have that big financial circle to tap into our, you know, um, I was in a, a three way primary. So that was a lot of people were saying, oh, I don't want any anything to do with this. Um, so there was a point in time where it's like you had to really, um, you know, be there for yourself um, and be there for your team. And um, I was so glad to have the support of all the indigenous peoples, you know, in our political small circle. Um, and I think we also have national training, Emily's List and like national democratic training um, they would have here in our, um, in the state of Kansas. And also my local uh, county party always offered a, a helping hand and questions if I had any. Thank you for that. I, and I, you know, with Advance, we're gearing up to be launching our training program soon too. And I'm really excited about having a national native led organization leading on training native candidates. And so uh, we'll create that, um, that ladder to be handing down and, and, and building with folks. I really appreciate what you said because that, that's, those are key takeaways that we want people to receive from those trainings, you know, um, you know help a, a campaign, uh, you know, get that hands-on experience, whether it's through an internship or, you know, being on the ground. I mean, volunteer, um, when you volunteer, you might be getting paid as well, right? Like it just is these steps up of engagement. Um, and that engagement ladder really varies from what your skill set is and what your capacity is. You know, if you love to be, um, you know, in your own space and more introverted, like I was in the beginning, I, I had no no problems being a phone banker. You know, I was a phone banker on the Obama campaign in a state like North Dakota, and that that gets you a lot of experience when you know there's folks not necessarily on your side um, having conversations with, but you're gaining experience on how to have conversations and find some some commonalities to to move people into engagement um then the key thing you, you were speaking about is those building relationships right reach out to those leaders who you have access to and and build that network because that network is what's going to help you get that support system to run for office and you know christina you said it ask questions right ask those hard questions and and figure out for yourself is is this the right moment is this the right time for me to run for office and um how do i do that who are the people around me right um our time is kind of running out, but I wanted to ask this other question too, because, you know, once you're a candidate and, and now you're in office, you're considered a, a public person and voters are going to be more interested in your family and your personal history. Um, and there may have been issues that might have been a, you know, potential campaign issue. Um, but how have you handled your life, your lives being under the microscope? Um, and what advice would you give or have you received on handling those hard situations? This is where I need the theme music for like, you know. I guess I'll go coverage. first. <laughs> um, it's a tough question, I know. So thank you for answering. Yeah, um, well, I've always, um, and I've taught my mentees here to keep your keep your private life private. Um, there's, you know, when people see us in, in, in the public or on social media, um, they think that's 
all we are and that that's it you know um they really don't know much um <clears throat> more about us because we try to keep some things to ourselves um and that's like a lot of people didn't know during my um this time that I was going to school that um, I had another goal which was to get my doctor's degree so they didn't know that I was like staying up late to try to finish my homework or papers or get ready for my dissertation um so those kind of things um try to keep something to yourself you know a lot of people post things all the time on social media um and I used to be like that like when I was in college and I wasn't in office and um also for our safety too you just never know who's out there watching you and murdered and missing indigenous women that's a big bit a big deal with us and so you have to be careful you have to be safe a lot of my you know, times I, I post things after I've already been there because there's, like you said, not a lot of people on your side. You want to try to um, protect yourself as much as you can. And, um, you know, to find peace of mind, you know, I stay active. I, I like to um, walk or take nature walks. Um, I like to swim or ride my bike. I mean, things like that. I like to um, keep to myself and when I'm in that time, because the last thing, and this is what I tell my family when I see them, let's not talk politics, let's not talk about, you know, what happened over the week, uh, you know, let's just, let's just keep it, you know, um, simple, like, how was your day, or what did you do, kind of thing, um, and try to take out time for you um, when you can, it can be hectic, but it's important to not forget who you are, and um, I, I like to powwow. I like to go to powwows when they have them again. I like to dance. Um, and that's what grounds me. And that's what kind of is my healing. Um, so that's that's what I, and like I said, I was a, in a, I've been in a fishbowl. I seem like my whole life, you know, being a royalty and, or whatever. And, and people always come up to me and say, you're my role model. So, you know, I always tried to watch what I, what I do. And, um, and that has helped over the years. I haven't had a lot of friends because I've not been able to like hang out with them, you know, like they wanted me to, but um, it's helped because you, you really want to try to keep your background clean. And so, um, you know, that's, that's my advice is to not forget who you are, um, learn, learn how to, you can ground yourself, like take nature walks or whatnot and take a break. Cause if you bring your work home it's gonna make you sick so <laughs> you have to find that balance and you have to keep things separate and that's that's how I live my life and it, it's worked for me yeah I would echo um doctor um representative dr Ponka Lee Victor's comments as well um I think of when I, um, so all the training that I've had throughout my life in terms of kind of being in the public eye, I think came mainly from sports um, and being a student athlete, um, you know, always um, being told you're a role model. And then, you know, just being a big sister to growing up and having a very strict mother um, also, I think helped, <laughs> but um, in terms of, you know, just having high expectations of yourself um, and also, you know, being in different arenas or be, where you're the only Native American and always wanting to fight um, stereotypes, you know, or to, to um, educate others that, that there's a, a different narrative to what's um, out there of Native people, Native Americans. And, um, I think when, when Representative Dr. Pankawi Victors was speaking, what came to mind also was different experiences in my first legislative session here um, in Bismarck. Um, so in 2019, um, just being out in the public, like one time my, my kids, you know, were in town, my family was in town uh, for their birthday weekend. And um, I ran to Walmart real quick to pick up some uh, things that we forgot for their birthday party at a different location of a venue, um, Sky Zone, and then um, seeing 
people in, in Walmart and, you know, acknowledging them and saying hi and then quickly grabbing what I had to grab and leaving. But later, um, kind of being like, I guess you could say um, people, it, it just was interesting to me that um, that when I was out in public that and I thought I had had greeted people, but I couldn't couldn't visit, stay and visit, but but that was upsetting to people. Um, and that really opened my eyes because I was like, wow, you know, I, I did not mean to offend or, um, you know, snub anybody or anything like that. I was trying to rush back to my kid's birthday party, you know, that I don't get to see very often because I'm in the state legislature. So just different things, different experiences kind of um, have opened my eyes eyes to, to also the public's high expectations of you now being in elected official position. Um, so. And I just want to reiterate too, um, I'm 26 and fresh out of college and all that. And, um, you know, I always knew that I was probably going to seek a job that, you know, if it was in DC or something or a director's position, um, my career goal that, you know, doing Facebook background checks is kind of the norm now. And, you know, people put your name in Google and, you know, you know, anything will pop up. So having that in mind and that having still be a reality, I encourage all young people to always, you know, keep it, keep it clean, um, keep it, you know, PG and, um, and that is probably one of the biggest recommendations. And I think, um, you know, going through your social media, if you're going to seek office um, before you make it public to go through it with a fine tooth comb, uh, check every comment that you did or, you know, maybe you just delete it. <laughs> um, so I think that is definitely um, and, you know, maybe I, in my campaign, there was like one photo that I thought was fine and I still think it's fine, but my opponent used it and, you know, try to twist it around and all that. And I was like, oh, I thought you know, only my knees were showing and, you know, so they can do that. And, you know, pretty much anything is fair game um, once you get into politics. And I had to make sure that I told my family and my friends and, you know, and told my partner's family as well, even though they live in another state, like just be prepared, you know, because politics is all fair game. Um, and, you know, how do I live my life now? You know, I'm on TikTok, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook. So my life is also consumed by social media. But, you know, I remember um, when I started the session, I was trying to answer all the emails and I would work on the weekends and I see uh, Representative Dr. Victor's on Monday. I'm like, oh my gosh, how do you keep up with all these emails? She goes, don't take your laptop home on the weekends. <laughs> That's the first thing. And I was like, I didn't even think about, you know, I. You know, I want to do good for my people. I want to be there for them 24 seven, but oh my gosh, it was just consuming, you know, my mental, my mental space. So um, she really taught me right off the bat, you know, always take care of yourself so you can take care of your people. But, you know, she would always ask me too, what did you do this weekend? That was good for you. I'm like, oh no, um, I slept in, <laughs> you know, so do something that is good for you. That makes you healthy enough to be here today um, and, you know, always, you know, be positive, um, but, you know, always be prepared for the backlash that, you know, if someone with ill intent has, you know, just keep that in mind at all times. And I've learned to, um, I used to be a very open person on my social media and now I've learned that, you know, I keep things private and make sure I have my privacy settings on. Um, and, you know, not only is, you um, my mentors here always watching a watch fly on me, but my campaign team is always, um, you know, say, hey, you know, we'll tweak that wording a bit or, you know, maybe that you should take that down. <laughs> that was too much information. <laughs> um, so I'm learning along as well. I'm a freshman, um, bound to make mistakes, but, you know, I'm always thankful to have um, my mentors here with me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate that that advice for for newcomers, but I, I think in general too. I mean, these are all helpful tips that just live your life. You know, make some boundaries. Um, you know, keep your private life private. Um, take time for you, right? Um, take a break. I, I like that one. You know, sleeping in. I wish I could sleep in. I've got puppies that are up at like six thirty in the morning. You know, like I'm. <laughs> 
<laughs> I gotta let them out, you know. Um, but you know, but public life, I, I have the luxury of not being in the public eye as much as you three. But this advice I feel is, um, you know, relevant for, for all of us. And even when you're talking to your family members and your close friends about running for office and stepping more into the public, you know, I remember having to do some of those conversations and um, not just letting them know that I'm going to run for office, but also being like, okay, you guys got to behave now. <laughs> you got to behave. Like, <laughs> I'm going to be judged because of you. Um, you know, those are some hard conversations that you have to have with your community sometimes. And I think about, um, you know, when others are, are on the fence, they, they remind themselves of those tough times that you got through. And I really appreciate you three sharing uh, this, this time with us because it's giving us that experience to, uh, you know, make a, a more informed decision as others are, are wanting to, to, to take a stand and to step into these systems and in these positions of power uh, and, and make a difference and make a change and realizing it doesn't have to be necessarily a career, but you can make a difference when you're in office and, and build those relationships. Um, oh gosh, we are coming to a close though. And I, I know this question is like super cheesy, but I, I feel like it's a nice way to end some conversations. As you think about your, your own leadership, the three of you are leaving an incredible legacy for those who come um, after you, stepping in and holding this door open for the rest of us. But who, who are those people for you? Who are the ones who held the door open? I mean, it could be that white guy, right? That you asked <laughs> to, to, to let you in, but, but, but who are those folks that, that you might consider a hero who held that space for you to step into this, um, this role that you're in now? I just want us to take a minute to like acknowledge and honor them, you know, because we, we are all, um, you know, coming through the doors that they're holding open. For me, it's all the strong women before me, um, you know, that that is in my life, my mom, my grandmother, my great grandmother, um, you know, even there's a story behind my name as well. And why I choose to go by Ponkawi, my my native name instead of my English name. I was given both names, but, um, you know, that talk that they gave me when I was <laughs> five years old going into kindergarten, they had said, I remember they sat down and by then I knew my name was Ponkawi. Everybody called me Ponkawi, my brothers, mom, dad, but it's my first day of school. And uh, my grandma, great grandmother said, you know, if you go by this name, I'm going to tell you, it's going to be hard. You're, you're going to go through life and a lot of people aren't going to accept you but just by looking at your name and they're not going to understand. And, you know, it's going to be a hard road, but if you choose your English name, you're going to have it a little bit easier. I didn't understand what she was talking about. I, I only knew, you know, I didn't even know my colors. And so first day of school, sure enough, um, uh, first day of school, they, um, the teacher was calling names and made little name tags for everybody. And, um, you know, I already knew how to print my name. My brothers worked with me and it is such a long name. And, um, and my grandmother also said, you know, but if you go by this name, you make them pronounce it correctly because it took us years to learn their, their names. They can take a few minutes out to learn your name. And so I always had that in my, in my head. And sure enough, I got in a fight <laughs> and on the playground, somebody, a boy, I was swinging in my little pretty dress and he called me a dirty Indian. Get off that mm -hmm. swing, you dirty Indian. And I was only five and I thought dirty meant like I didn't take a shower that morning and growing up with two brothers, um, we got in a big fight and it was like, it was crazy. I got sent to the principal's office, but everybody was like, why did you get in a fight? And I said, because he called me a dirty Indian. And everybody was like, reaction, like, oh my gosh, you know, um, shocked. And so from that point on, I knew I was gonna have to have, a, I was, it was gonna be tough and it still is tough. Um, in the legislature, sometimes they say, don't you have a na name we could call you? You know, no, you know, this is my name. This is who I am. And so those strong women and just taking their advice really has helped me, um, shape me who I am today that, you know, no, you, you can, you can learn my name. I'll help you and educate. Uh, we're constantly educating uh, my colleagues and, um, about who we are and, um, 
And, and then I think about all the strong women before me, like I think of Wilma, Wilma Mankiller, you know, I think of all these native women leaders who, who, um, who made a path for us and I'm forever thankful for that. I can't never forget them. And, and I'm just, I'm so appreciative of, of them and for being, um, making that way for us. Yes, I would, um, gosh, so many, you know, um, thinking of those that have gone before us, you know, I think of all of the, the women, I think of my grandma, my mom, um, Tilly Walker, Reba Walker, Rosemary Mandan, um, just a lot of the women, um, but also I think within my immediate family too, I think of my um, late uncle Junior and my grandpa, um, both were on the council for three affiliated Mandan, Hidatsa, and Rikra Nation. Um, and then today in the present time, I think of um, Representative Dr. Victor, uh, geez, sorry, I'm still getting used to the doctor. Representative Dr. Just call me <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> and uh, Prairie Rose. Lillian Jones, you know, both of those women had run for office in Fargo and, and that really, um, I, I remember feeling so proud to see native women. Um, and then from, we were from, we're from the same tribal nation or native nations. And so that was really inspiring for me to see that it can be done and they were already, you know, breaking the ground and paving the way for us. So um, that's who comes to mind for me. So thank you, Madzigirads, Pray Rose, <laughs> and Pankui. Uh, what comes to my mind is um, my ancestors, and you know, being Diné, we always start off with our first four clans, um, and always remembering how far along we came, and for the survival of our people. Um, you know, another, you know, influence in my life is my mother, who you know pushed me through all the schooling. Um, and was there making, you know, I come from a family who wasn't politically active, um, but I, I grew up watching my mom vote. And once I said, hey, I'm running for office, um, you know, we, we don't go to rallies or we don't, we never held a yard sign in our yard. And my yard sign was the first in, in the yard, uh, which was really great. And, you know, I had my family making phone calls and it's like, okay, how do we do this? I'm like, I don't know, I'm learning with you. And you know, my dad, you know, assembling the yard signs, all 100 of them, and, um, you know, and it, everyone kind of learned along with me. And that's, I always try to make it a point that, you know, you don't have to be in uh, this political space to to make change. You know, we could all learn together at any age. Um, but I also want to thank, you know, Representative Dr. Punkwee Victors is probably the reason why I'm here today. <laughs> um, and I'm, con I'm continuing to learn. I, you know, I think it's only our, our 12th week here, <laughs> and um, I feel like I've just um, gone, uh, learned a lot, and, you know, she she would put me through the boot camp and sit me down, and <laughs> um, but, you know, it's all going to pay off, um, and it has, you know, paid off here and there, and we'll continue the fight, and then, you know, Representative Buffalo has helped me along the way, even when she stopped by Kansas one day and she was like, hey, we're going to meet. <laughs> we never met in person. <laughs> um, other strong, you know, young, uh, other strong Native women across the country. And, you know, during the campaign season, um, there was other Indigenous candidates that ran and I would just message them and hope they would message me back and we would get on a quick phone call and I'd be like, so how is it over there? And, <laughs> you know, how is it in Kansas? Um, but also, I, I want to go ahead and give my credits to, um, you know, Madam Secretary Holland, who was also another mentor of mine, and she helped me um, with a stump speech. Um, and it was just really great to see at all levels of Native peoples in office and politics. Really, you know, I, I felt like I started, I was fresh out of grad school and I got asked to run for office um, by uh, Makakwa Jones here, and she is a, a name that I believe she worked with Representative Dr. Victors as well. Um, and she is such a, a powerhouse in our community in, in Lawrence. Um, and she's the one that made that phone call that night. So I, you know, I wouldn't be here without these indigenous women here in Kansas. And oh boy, it's uh, it's really powerful to see that. And I hope, you know, I bring the I I you know, 
get another native person here and you know leave the door open and hold the ladder down for more indigenous peoples to be in this space because we need we need to be here um i know it's intimidating i know it's scary uh but you know you have us and uh, we're more than happy to help you through the process well i want to extend another way to go thank you from uh, the bottom of my heart the whole heart for you all making time with us i know the three of you are incredibly busy right now in sessions within your state moving moving pieces forward uh i want to thank you for sharing your power with us in this space. I want to thank you for protecting your power within your own space and doing the work that you do. Uh, I hope that those around you also protect that power for you. And uh, we have to we have to close. It's it's our closing time right now. So we appreciate you giving us this time and the gift of your your wisdom and experience. And so the rest of you will see you on the next uh, series edition of We Belong Here. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you.